Hi, I'm Sally Glass and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Dallas Museum of Art and speak with curator Sabeha al Kamir about the museum's exhibition, NUR, Light and Art and Science from the Islamic World. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm Liz Trosper, and I'm here at the DMA with Sabia al Kamir, Senior Advisor for Islamic Art for the Dallas Museum of Art, and also Curator of Noor, Light in Art and Science from the Islamic World. Sabia, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so first question, can you tell us a little bit about the concept behind the exhibition Noor? Noor, as you know, is an Arabic word that means light. Um, but it's a beautiful word because it has a physical and metaphysical dimension. In Arabic, you could call light also dhaw, which is not, doesn't have that metaphysical, you know, spiritual dimension. So it is called nur, and it brings into the light, you know, science and art to express something about Islamic culture. You mentioned the metaphysical piece um, of the exhibition. Could you talk a little bit more about how that plays in um, throughout the course of the exhibition and the particular pieces that you chose and how religion fits into that? There are more than just Islamic um, pieces of art within this exhibition. There are also Jewish pieces and Christian pieces as well. Could you talk a little bit about the metaphysical and the religious aspect within the exhibition? Uh, this is actually not a religious exhibition. And what we call Islamic art is in fact not religious. Most of it is not religious art. But in Islamic culture, religion is totally integrated. It is integrated in a way of life. And we find that dimension of the metaphysical in many ways, in different aspects. You look at an object and it has a functional, uh, you know, raison d'etre. It's there for everyday life. Uh, it has, you know, whether to contain water or food or whatever, but it could have the most wonderful saying that is a proverb or a, a saying of the prophet or, you know, something that connects with religion, but is not, it, this is not a religious object. So in that sense, these objects celebrate life. They are part of everyday life. Uh, maybe, you know, in more uh, sort of luxurious households, <laughs> but, you know, it's a celebration <laughs> of, of life. But uh, to connect more to your question, I mean, these objects uh, express a culture which actually has that dimension of diversity and unity. And so you find, uh, for example, here we are behind a Torah uh, holder, a case, a Torah case, which is a Jewish piece, but at the same time, we're calling it Islamic art because you know, it uses the same type of arabesque, the same kind of decoration, the same kind of artistic style as you know, uh, other pieces for, that are totally for uh, Islamic use or just functional use, not religious. But in other words, just to say that you know, Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, especially in uh, medieval Spain, you know, they uh, did know amazing, wonderful um, time of harmony and uh, convivencia. So Spain, you mentioned Spain, um, and I feel that geography plays a, a big role in this exhibition. Can you talk a little bit about the partnership, um, partner institutions for this exhibition and how uh, geography, in particular Spain, uh, plays a role in the objects that are here at the DMA? Well, this whole thing, this whole project started with Spain. It is thanks to uh, a company called uh, Abingoa, which is a solar um, energy company. Um, it is the overall umbrella of um, a foundation that is called Focus Abingoa in Seville, in Spain, uh, that this whole thing came about. I mean, it started with a visit to the solar energy uh, place and it was amazing, Liz. It was amazing. Light was everywhere. I mean, if you can imagine standing <laughs> there and having these, you know, um, light, but basically just light as far as you can see, right, left, and center, and you're in the middle of that, bathed in light. Uh, I'm not going to go phony on you, but <laughs> that <laughs> feeling, I mean, that feeling of absolute pure light. I remember we were at the very initial stages of, you know, discussing the project. And I thought, wow, I mean, light is really a connecting, you know, force uh, between not just all religions and cultures. It's, it's 
might bathe us all and we can't grasp it, we can't hold it, but it is an amazing, amazing, wonderful thing. And so how appropriate that to an exhibition that is trying to talk about bridging, that is also trying to bring, as you well put it, the, the geography, I mean, to bring together you know, um, the geography from as far as, from Spain as far as Central Asia or East Asia, because Islam, you know, is um, a culture that really connects a very, very wide geographical span. It also connects, you know, it crossed so many centuries, I mean, from the seventh century to, you know, the present day, and there are objects here from the ninth century, from, you know, the 20, up to the 21st century, early 21st century, some of the scientific, you know, objects are from, are from the, like sundials and so on, from the early 21st century. So, this is an exhibition that draws a huge arc geographically, but also time-wise. The exhibition um, you mentioned is about history and about aesthetics. And so I wanted to ask you the art historical influences that you think the, these uh, items here in the exhibition have. How have they influenced um, today's aesthetics? And then also historically, you mentioned some of the uh, advancements in the um, science and technology portion of the exhibition. Can you talk a little bit more about those influences? Well, the influences um, are not linked to a particular time or place, per se. I mean, they, they are part of the fabric of life. When you say people, whatever religion, whatever culture, they interact with each other and things happen. And, you know, politically you can uh, define one era from another and say, you know, the rule of this uh, dynasty, you know, comes to an end here, but another dynasty starts and so on, but life doesn't work like that. For example, Copts, you know, and Muslims in Egypt, they, they work together, you know, with the arrivals, arrival of Muslims in Spain, for example. Coptic uh, workshops were producing woodwork. Those workshops didn't stop. They continued, and with them, that visual tradition, that visual language that is part of a culture, you know, is enmeshed, is woven, it is part of a fabric, you know, that becomes an overall embracing fabric. And so influences also go in all sorts of ways. There is no linear one way, you know, system for influences because life is more dynamic, as you know. <laughs> so, but to give you just few specific examples, of that influence, of that interaction that, you know, influences uh, beyond, you know, the place where things start. For example, Luster painted pottery. Uh, Luster painted pottery uh, is considered uh, an innovation of the Muslim artist. It started in Iraq in the 9th century. It went to Egypt, you know, 10th, 11th century. From Egypt, it went to Syria, to Iran. From there, it went to Spain and from Spain it went to the rest of the world. And so, even today in America, somewhere in, I don't know, Arkansas, somebody is making luster ceramics, his work connects directly, you know, across time, across centuries, from America to 9th century Iraq. You know, a craftsman who was sitting there doing luster, which is a complex technique. I mean, luster is, a, you know, we can never be sure exactly of the recipe of the 19th century, but we know that this complex technique, which used two firings and used metallic ox oxides to paint on the ceramics, create a sheen of light on the ceramics. And depending on the ingredients and depending on the recipe, it can vary from a golden hue because it has a high content of tin to a sort of reddish hue because it has a high content of copper. But that's, for example, the, I mean, the migration story of luster. I find it a fantastic metaphor of this influence that goes in all sorts of directions. In terms of science, and I don't think we can really separate from between art and science because science influences art with its technology and so on, and art, um, you know, uh, basically uh, helps science sometimes even in manuscripts when you see these beautiful illustrations have a didactic dimension, etc. So influences went in all sorts of ways, but one main thing is translation. Translation was key. I mean, in Beit al-Hikmah, or the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, in 9th, 10th century Baghdad in Iraq, I mean, there was a campaign of translation. I mean, 
Greek texts were translated into Arabic. Um, and you know, with that, you can Im imagine the dissemination of knowledge. And that tradition of translation carried on in Spain. So you have in 12th, 13th century Toledo, you know, in Spain, you have this, again, campaign of translation. So those texts, again, were translated into Latin and into Spanish. And so influences went in all sorts of directions because those Arabic texts had annotations. They had further innovation in terms of scientific thought and uh, knowledge, etc. And so that is what actually built the foundation for the Renaissance. And that has influenced the Western world. And that influences our lives today in ways that we are not necessarily conscious of, you know, on the first degree level. But it's all interconnected. You've sort of brought us around to this topic of the written word. And there's a very strong connection between light, the written word, the artistic expressions that, that we see all around here. I want to come for a moment to the illuminated manuscripts. And one of the very striking um, components of this exhibition is the Blue Quran. Um, and you, st you talked briefly about that. So I'd like to ask you to speak for a moment about the illuminated manuscripts and what you've brought here to the DMA, and then also the artistic influence that they've had for you personally and where you've taken that um, in your work. You are so well informed. <laughs> Uh, well, first, the, you know, I'm sure you noticed that there is this uh, little inkwell that is very beautiful, but it's small, and it's highlighted in the middle of the theme on knowledge. Uh, why do you think the inkwell is there? You wonder, but it's because precisely the importance of the word in Islamic culture, the written word, is so significant. It influenced uh, the arts and the science in many directions. And the written word had acquired that sacredness, if you will, because the only miracle of Islam is the Quran. And the Quran comes in classical Arabic, the most beautiful classical Arabic, uh, you know, to Muhammad, who was not a prophet then, but uh, who was illiterate. And the first word that the archangel Gabriel, Gabriel is a Here's the commonality, <laughs> you know, the Archangel Gabriel, the first word that he spoke to Prophet Muhammad is Iqra, read. So reading, writing and knowledge became so important and the dissemination of knowledge and the copying of texts and manuscripts became a main, a ver the arts of the book in general became very, very important components of Islamic art, what we call Islamic art. Now, Calligraphy becomes an art in its own right that is pretty amazing. I mean, an, an endless way of writing the word, you know, uh, different sort of styles developed in different parts of the Islamic world, but they all come back to common rules, common tradition, common, which, you know, is linked to the importance of the word. And so the illumination of manuscripts consequently becomes important if the word is so important. You are beautifying, you know, around the world. You are creating light around the world. And you look at manuscripts and the use of gold and color brings light to the page. And in that respect, one particular example that, you know, springs to mind is precisely the so-called blue Quran. And blue, I mean, it has nothing to do with Quran. <laughs> what is blue Quran? Is the Quran blue? No, it wouldn't mean anything you know, for someone who comes from Islamic culture even to say the Blue Quran. But the name Blue Quran stuck because in the Islamic art field, there is only one manuscript that is written on this, you know, uh, sort of blue dyed indigo uh, page, uh, vellum or parchment, written in gold, which brings light to the page. It's like stars in a deep night, in a dark night. It's and amazing. yeah, and beside its you know, spiritual dimension, visually, when you look at this manuscript, it is so modern. Although it was done 9th, 10th century <laughs> Qairawan in Tunisia, you look at it, and it's graphically stunning. And it has a universal dimension that speaks to all, because it has that sort of, um, you know, when the word almost becomes an image that is beyond its immediate uh, communicative tool as, as language is just graphically so amazing 
that it is A, written what is called Kufic script that started in Kufa in Iraq. And that script, with its geometrical shapes and angular forms and so on, has again, as I said, this graphic quality that is emphasized further by the fact that even structurally, the way the text is arranged on the page is sometimes a word is interrupted or I don't want to use the word broken, but sort of a word is sort of, you know, it starts on one line, continues in the next line, and it's sort of, it has no diacritical marks because, you know, there are 17 uh, consonants in, let's say, in Arabic and you need to put the, the dots and so on, let's say the same shape if you put a dot on top. It's a ne, put it underneath, it's a be, put two dots, it's a te. So the sound changes completely. So you imagine, if you don't have diacritical marks, how are you going to read it? Well, if you know the Quran by heart, your heart becomes simply a mirror of this text. And so the dimension of this is amazing. You have this, as I said, calligraphy with all its geometric sort of balance with this layout on the page in such a modern way without diacritical marks and with this contrast of duality between dark and light and literally the word is light on the page I mean it speaks to everyone do you see what I mean it has a sort of universality that I believe is so modern and furthermore this so-called blue Quran which you know um, I mean was done in Tunisia, produced in Tunisia, its pages were dispersed in the 20th century, um, you know, to, to acquire, I mean, to sell, obviously, <laughs> I mean, they were sold or whatever, but they were dispersed and there are different pages in different collections, you know, museums and uh, private collections, etc. And I was so touched by this work that is, A, aesthetically, as I tried to describe, you know, is so beautiful. Um, but it's not signed, we don't know who wrote, who gave their time and life to this artwork. And it has such universal modern quality and it is dispersed in terms of its physicality around the world, etc. That became for me a metaphor for something. I don't have to go into it, but all I can say is that it inspired me to write a word of fiction that is called the Blue Manuscript which has different layers, you know, from the sort of 10th century, 9th, 10th century, when the actual manuscript, manuscript was being produced by the calligrapher, and the 20th century, where some archaeologists in Egypt, in the middle of the de desert, are digging, looking for the so-called blue Quran. It's clear that your, your um, passion for this work comes through. Um, what do you want people to experience? What, what's important about this as people come through near? What do you want them to leave with? When you step into this exhibition, you probably felt, Liz, that um, you're in a different world. And I think that has been communicated not just by the objects themselves, but even by the sort of atmosphere that is created in this space, which almost, I mean, I've been told <laughs> yesterday that, you know, you, you step in and you want to go quiet, okay? So, in a way, I worked very, very closely on not just content and concepts and design, and because for me it's content and container are one. Uh, you can't separate form from you know, content. And my hope was to create an experience that transports you into, an, into another world without much props. You know, the objects are themselves, you know, the protagonists here, but it's like you are transported into this different world. You go quite looking at these objects, one object at a time. And we're in America where everything is big, but these objects are small. And you humbly come close and you look and you give importance and significance to these little things. And believe me, in each one of them, to me at least, I can see there's a huge world inside. And that huge world inside, that little object, is my gift to the visitor. And I think that huge world is as big as you can make it. And so, in a way, this is a journey into a different world, into an outer world, but it is a journey into an inner world. Thank you. Sabia al thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me, and it's a joy to give this gift to the visitor 
I hope that it gives an experience of really an insight into the sophistication and the refinement of an amazing culture that is part of humanity at large. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. We want to thank Sabiha for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to dma.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo.